fish were swimming along one day, and an older fish swam up and said, good morning, boys, how's the water? And then he swam away, and one of the younger fish looked at the other fish and said, what the hell is water? This little story was told by one of my favorite 20th century authors, David Foster Wallace, in a commencement address that he gave, which is online, and there's a video of it as well, which is quite entertaining. But his point of this little story was that the really important things in life, the, the point he was getting across to these students were the things that are, are so common that you stop noticing them anymore. It's just like the water around a fish that you never even see them anymore. And I want to talk about some of those things in the technology world. So I'm borrowing or stealing his metaphor and applying it to technology. And I'm going to do so around these three Greek symbols. And the first of these symbols I'm going to talk about is mu, which in mathematics is the uh, constant of friction. Uh, but when we think about friction in the software world, we don't think about friction from a physics standpoint. We think about friction in terms of what, happening, what happens around engineering practices. Any kind of engineering practice you have where you have introduced a silo or something like that, you've introduced friction into an engineering process. And this happens a lot of times on development teams without them even realizing it. Just like the water around fish, you start doing something and not realize the negative implications of it. And we're really big in this world about having a holistic approach of all of our engineering practices to make sure they work together well. So let me give you an example of that. Now, one of these practices that's very common in the Agile world is this idea of continuous integration. And this was founded by the extreme programming guys because their philosophy was, let's take all these things that we know have worked well in the past and push them as far to the extreme as possible. And integration was one of those things that they observed that on projects where we were eager with integration, we had a lot fewer integration-based headaches. And so, of course, the most extreme version of that is continuous integration, which everybody commits to the main line at least once a day. But we very quickly built machinery to do this stuff for us, and now we equate the idea of continuous integration with this really awesome machinery we have to do all these tasks for us. And this is a really nice thing. But in many ways, we've lost the original intent of this idea that everyone commits to the trunk at least once a day. And let me give you an example of how projects have inadvertently strayed away from this good advice. Let's say you have this scenario. We're using some sort of sane version control, and you've decided that there's a feature that you may or may not want in the next release of your software. And so you decide, I'm going to use branches and version control to model this problem. This is an engineering practice known as feature branching, using branching and version control to handle speculative in-flight features while main development is still going on on trunk. And so Professor Plum picks one of these new in-flight features, and Reverend Green picks the other one, and they start working and doing little commits on their branches. Now, both Reverend Green and Professor Plum, being good version control citizens, know that you should periodically pull from the trunk, because active development is still going on in the trunk, and so the best practice is to pull periodically and handle the little merge conflicts that pop up. A few days go by, a few weeks go by, maybe a couple of months go by, and it's decided, you know what, we love Professor Plum's new feature. We want it in the code base. And so Professor Plum pushes to trunk and performs what we refer to as a merge ambush on Reverend Green. Because Reverend Green didn't do anything wrong. He came into work on Monday morning, did SVN up, and then slam. All of a sudden, he's got a month's worth of merge conflicts to deal with, which really sucks for Reverend Green. But there's a bigger problem lurking here as well. What happened if on the very first day of his branch, Reverend Green started making profound changes to the customer class? On the very first day of his branch, Professor Plum started making profound changes to the customer class in the opposite direction. They've now been coding in isolation for a couple of months, and now Reverend Green has a terrible decision to make. Do I go back and undo all the work I did on customer and reconcile my vision of customer with Professor Plum, or, and this is what I'm terrified of, do I create a second version of the customer class so that I don't waste all that effort that I put in? This ultimately is a failing of continuous integration. 
What we've done is traded one engineering practice, feature branching, for another one, continuous integration. Because when you're living on a branch, you are no longer doing continuous integration anymore. And this is a bad, bad trade-off. Because it turns out that feature branching ends up damaging three really useful engineering practices. Continuous integration, opportunistic refactoring, because if you're living on a feature branch, you're never going to refactor something that needs to be fixed because you're going to make your merge conflict that much worse. And really hard to do things like, I want to see both features or neither feature or some combination of those features. There are engineering practices that support this, and you could actually fix this by doing proper continuous integration across these branches, but we're not really interested in that. We're much more interested in the engineering practices around this phrase of trunk-based development, which are things like feature toggles and the branch by abstraction and the strangler pattern. These are engineering practices that allow you to preserve the really useful practice of continuous integration and still be able to handle in-flight features and making sure that incomplete things don't show up on trunk, et cetera. So this is really a trade-off, but it really this awareness of the effect that all of your engineering practices are having on the other engineering practices. And this brings up kind of an interesting problem that we have, is that meta work is more interesting than work. So how many of you would say, in your deep heart of hearts, if you're explaining your job to your grandmother, it really kind of boils down to, I take the things off the web page and put them in the relational database, and I take the things from the relational database and put them on the web page. And you know what? That's not horribly exciting if you've done that for 20 or 30 times already. So you know what developers do when they're faced with dull day jobs? They invent cool puzzles to solve and spend all their day solving the puzzles they have created. Because meta work is a lot more interesting than work. Everybody here knows that working on a framework is way cooler than building the CRUD application that actually needs the framework because meta work is a lot more interesting than work. And so we see these crazy mixed up kind of branching strategies where nobody actually understands what constitutes a release and what they've done is invented an awesome puzzle they can solve every single day. This was actually identified back in 2003. Jamie Zwiski wrote this famous blog. Uh, this is about GNOME. And he was complaining that every version of GNOME that he got, there were a whole bunch of bugs that never got fixed until the next version came out. And he called this the cascade of attention deficit teenagers model of software development. <laughs> that nothing is ever actually complete because everybody wants to move on to the next shiny thing. I remember when they open sourced Mozilla, they had a million people request to write the new rendering engine for HTML, and they had zero people volunteering to write the print preview dialog. Because you know what? That's like work, and people don't want to do that. So that's friction. Next, let's talk about delta, which again in mathematics is about change. Now I want to talk about several aspects of change. And this is one of those really insidious things that affects a lot of people in this career. Because you get interested in computers at, a, at an early age, so you start spending a lot of time with computers, which means you start spending a lot of other time with people who have an interest in computers. And they all have more or less the same gender that you do. And then time goes by, and that gets concentrated more and more and more over time. Uh, so this is a famous picture from 1975 of the original Microsoft team. And you'll notice that they had just three women, no, sorry, <laughs> just two women on this project. That's actually the owner of the company there in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, so the ratio here of men to women in the original Microsoft picture is 11 to 2. Unfortunately, as an industry, we haven't done much better since the early 70s. There are lots of statistics that show that we have very, very few. There's like 10 to 1, 17% uh, of job placements, 7% of, of developers are hired by women, uh, were hired as women. And this is really bad beyond just the obvious reasons this is bad, that monocultures are kind of bad. Uh, and here's some evidence that you can use to help your gender diversity. They've done a study that shows that when you have a group of people doing creative work like engineering, that when you add women to the team, the collective intelligence of the team goes up. Not just because the women have a higher IQ, it's because the presence of women raises the collective intelligence of the entire team. So everybody on the team instantly gets smarter as soon as one woman shows up and starts contributing to this team. And in fact, there's a pretty strong correlation up to 50% that the more women you add, the smarter your team is. 
This has to do with empathy and a lot of other social contexts that uh, developers are particularly bad at, but this is the reason that we need more women in this field. We need to stop chasing them away as if it were fraternity and find better ways to foster diversity in this profession because it's good for everybody. So that's change and structure. Let's talk about some other kinds of change that are like water. And one of those things is transactions. We treat transactions like the water we swim in, and we've taught our users that transactions are free. And you, when you have big, giant, monolithic applications, they are kind of free, because you can basically ah, just do a transaction, wrap that whole thing in a transaction. But as you get more distributed, and as you build more and more service-based systems, you start realizing that you can't really wrap everything in transactions anymore. But this is really a false thing that we've sold our users, because the real world is not very transactional. One of my colleagues a few years ago very famously made the observation that your corner coffee shop does not do a two-phase commit. If your coffee shop did a two-phase commit, then you would hand them money and they would hand you coffee at the same time and you'd both let go at the same instant. <laughs> That's a transaction. But you don't do that. You give them money and then you wander to a whole different part of the store and then trust that your coffee is eventually going to show up. Why doesn't your coffee shop do a proper two-phase commit? They don't because it's screamingly inefficient to do two-phase commits in the real world. ATMs don't do transactions in the real world because every ATM has a failure mode. That means even if I'm not connected to the mothership, I'll still give out money and we'll reconcile an audit at the end of the day. We've told users that transactions were free, but they're not. In fact, transactions existed before computers did. And at one point in time, bank records traveled on horseback and there is no two-phase commit when a pony's involved. We've got to get away from this idea that everything can be transactional. In fact, what we're moving into is a world where we're more interested in base versus acid. Of course, everyone here is familiar with acid. That's our atomic, consistent, isolated, and durable transactional characteristics. But now we're seeing many more systems that are more interested in base, which is basic availability, soft state, and eventual consistency. And part of this is because of math. Because they've done some studies that show that as your number of users increase and you have to get more and more distributed in the way that you handle your data, at some point your data gets too big to put in a monolith anymore and you have to start distributing it. And the more distributed you get, you have to end up going more base than acid because of cap theorem. There's actually a mathematical proof about this that once you reach a certain level of distribution for your data, you cannot do transactions anymore and guarantee all those acid characteristics. And so you see a lot of interesting architectural work now around the ideas of base and several other related acronyms versus things like transactions. And in fact, this is another really nice change that has come into our world recently because five years ago, it was the relational database golden hammer. Every problem looked like a nail and we had a relational database as a hammer to solve it. But now we're thinking a lot more about the problems of data and different shapes of data and different kinds of tools. This really struck home for me when I was working with a client who was using Oracle and they were trying to create a, a network graph using Oracle. I think they finally got the query to run at about eight and a half hours and they did it on Neo4j which is a graph database and the same query ran in about a third of a second. And that made them realize maybe this Oracle thing is not the perfect tool for every single problem. And so we have a really nice uh, variety of NoSQL databases now, but including some very unusual ones. And I wanted to point you to this one in case you haven't seen it. This is an interesting project from the Clojure community. Uh, this is this thing called a Datomic. This is an immutable database server. So wrap your head around that for a second. Once you put something in here, it never leaves. But everything is immutable and you can never change anything. And so it's really a value store rather than a data store. Because, and this is a gross simplification, but think of how many times the number two shows up in your relational database. In a datomic database, it would only show up once and everybody that needs two would reference two. Because there's only one two in that universe and it's never changing, just like the real world is. And so lots of interesting things pop out of something like Datomic because one of the things that we, uh, one of the big headaches in the continuous delivery world is this idea of, of uh, database migrations, be able to migrate a database forward and backwards in time. It's trivial in Datomic because every state that's ever been there is still there. You just back up in time and go see it if you want. 
In fact, this shows a kind of an interesting perspective shift that we suffer from in architecture a lot. Because why does your relational database do a destructive update? When you do an update in your relational database, you destroy that old data and replace it with a new one. Why are you doing that? Because you're destroying valuable trending information when you do that. Well, you know, we have to do that because hard drive space is really, really expensive and we really need to maximize our architecture around hard drive. Oh, wait a minute. That was true about 30 years ago when they invented relational databases. You know what? Hard drive space is as cheap as air now. And building architectures around 30-year-old limitations is not a good idea. And guys like this are rethinking the whole fundamental idea around what do we mean when we're storing values and building really, really interesting things. And this just points to a trend. We always build trends in architecture, and we always have reasons for these trends. And the, the big trend over the last, I don't know, five or 10 years has been getting really, really good at sharing resources because we've been chasing scale forever. Our problem keeps scaling up in size, and so we need to find really effective ways to share resources. And so that's why you get these uh, architectures with things like enterprise service buses and routing and all this machinery and, and mechanisms. Uh, and there are reasons to do that. But then a funny thing happens. The architectural constraint that we were designing around disappears and leaves us with these architectures that assume those constraints. Because our big problem right now is not shared resources. Uh, this led us to things like application servers and industrial strength database servers, layered architectures about effective sharing of resources. That's not our big problem now, though, because resources are now really cheap. Amazon will rent you resources for pennies on the dollar if you want. You can spin up your own machinery. Uh, with tools like Docker and, and combinations like Docker and Mesosphere, you can spin up machine images on the cloud and move them around now. This is not our big problem. Our big problem is all the coupling we introduce trying to share all those resources. So we're always chasing these constraints. And this is a problem because it makes isolated change hard. I can't just change this part of my layered architecture because my, it's smeared across all these layers and now I'm, I have to do a big bang deployment to change all those things. It makes upgrades difficult. I need to upgrade the ORM library for this part of my application, but if everybody's sharing everything, then I have to update everybody at the same time. Ultimately, what this does is make change expensive. And that's bad, because the only thing I can tell you about what your architecture will look like in five years is it probably won't look anything like it does now. If history is any gauge, then it's always in flux and it's always changing. This is a mistake that a lot of architects make, is they think they're trying to solve an equation. And once they get that equation solved, they can just walk back and drop the microphone and they're all done. But it's never an equation, it's always a snapshot of this thing that's in motion all the time. And so the point here is that very often yesterday's best practice becomes tomorrow's anti-pattern. We need to guard against this and try to build architectures that support rather than punish change. A lot of the work that you see around service and microservice architecture is exactly around this goal of making change less expensive. Therefore, it doesn't have to be something that we dread quite so much. So that's all about change. And the last Greek symbol I want to talk about is lambda. And this requires a little history from me. When I went to university, uh, we had this thing called Pecan Pascal. Anybody here ever heard of Pecan Pascal? Be, be careful, you, you'll date yourself if you say that you've, you know this, this technology. The cool thing about Pecan Pascal and the P system was you could write one piece of software uh, and, in Pascal and it would run on both an IBM PC and an Apple II because they compiled it to this stuff called bytecode instead of compiling it to real machine code. And that was really cool because now you had machine independence for Pascal running in this virtual machine. And the problem was it was slower than Christmas. I mean, it was too slow even for college projects. But then about a decade later, Java came along with essentially the same kind of architecture, but over time, technology had caught up. And it was a, a reasonable thing to do at that time, in the, the early 90s. So in a decade later, this made sense. The point of this is that over time, we cede more and more busy work to our languages and runtime. 
We now don't really deal with memory allocation, garbage collection very much because we've ceded that to our language and runtime uh, state via things like closures, even things like caching, which I'll talk about in a second. You can now just cede that completely to your runtime. Concurrency, that's one of the really nice things about the closure ecosystem is because they've redesigned uh, some fundamentals of the way that the uh, language interacts with the JVM. You can write perfectly high-performance, multi-concurrent applications in closure and never worry about blocks or deadlocks or any kind of synchronization because the runtime, the language handles all that stuff. This is universally a good thing because I've done work in languages like C++ and Pascal before, and I've reached an important conclusion that life's too short for malloc. I just don't want to solve this level of problem anymore. I mean, this is fun to dig through stack traces, you know, dig and do some detective work and all that. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt, don't want to go back. I'm much happier working at a higher level of abstraction, and that really is what we see over time our languages and runtimes handle more and more of this busy work for us. And the last kind of exemplar of this is the very slow kind of accretion of functional programming in all the major languages. Java was the last big holdout. All the major languages now have these really nice functional features. And that's important beyond just the fact that, oh, we have code we can pass around now. Mike Feathers, the guy who wrote Working with Legacy Code, has a terrific quote um, about object versus functional programming. And he says that object orientation makes code understandable by encapsulating moving parts. So think about the things you know about the programming languages that you know, like C Sharp or Java. There are lots of mechanisms to hide state or selectively hide state. You can read this, but you can't change it. And you, you can't even see any of this. This is private. This is completely isolated. You never see any of that. There's a lot of mechanisms in languages to do that. Functional, pro functional programming makes code understandable by minimizing moving parts. The theory being, if you don't have to see or interact with that part, you can never make mistakes with it. It's just like garbage collection in our modern languages. You never have to interact with that. You just don't think about it anymore. So let me show you some examples that exemplify Mike Feather's quote. And one really common bit of water that everyone's swimming in is this book, Design Patterns. It's a really, really useful book about object-oriented software. And so here's a good example of applying a design pattern. This is the, the, the end result of a refactoring exercise that I do in another talk. The point that I get to here is that notice that everything here is boilerplate except the two lines that say add here. And so if I want to convert this into reusable code, the advice from design pattern says well, what I need to do is make those two abstract and I can use the command design pattern and then pull this out and do something like this. So here's the command design pattern where here's my specific work that I want to do, and now I've created a template for doing the, the work there. But when you have a language that has code blocks or lambdas, you don't need the command design pattern anymore because you have portable code. Remember, the command design pattern was explicitly invented because there was no portable code in C++, which is where they designed the small talk, where, the, where one of the, the uh, inspirations for the... Uh, the uh, design Patterns book, but we have languages now that have those facilities, so this is completely deprecates the uh, command design pattern when you have some of these functional constructs. A great example of eliminating moving parts. You no longer have to hand code a command design pattern because it's now fundamentally built into the language. A good handful of those common design patterns melt away when you have proper functional programming. Now let me show you an even cooler example. Memoization, which is supported or very easy to implement in just about any functional language. So this is some code. Now what it does is not particularly important. This is classifying integers based on some particular criteria. The, the code that I really care about here is the sum of factors, the third method down. Basically what this does is go through and sum all the factors of a number and sum them up to see what the sum of those factors is. And maybe I've decided by looking at the usage of this code that I don't want to do that over and over again. Maybe summing is a, a, an expensive operation because these are really huge numbers. And so I've decided what I want to do is I only want to calculate the sum of a particular number once and then cache that so I only have to do that work one time. So that's a common kind of optimization. I can go in, this is all in Groovy, which is a, a Java dialect. And so I can go in and write my handwritten cache using a hash table or a hash map. And a lot of you have written code just like this. If it contains the number, then uh, if it doesn't contain the, the uh, key, then put it in there and then return the cache. 
But in a functional programming language, you don't have to do that anymore because of memoization. Groovy supports memoization. And if you have a pure function, and some factors here is a pure function, meaning it has no side effects outside of itself, you can return a memoized version of it by saying some factors dot memoize and copy that into some of factors, and now you're all done. The runtime will now cache all of those values for you. So every time you get a repeated sum, it's going to return it from the cache for you. You never have to handwrite a cache again. And in fact, you can interact with this cache. You can say memoize at least this many elements, memoize at most this, this many, many elements. Uh, you can customize it programmatically, but never have to write that low-level caching code again. A good example of Mike Feather's idea of minimizing moving parts, because now you don't have to interact with that, and there's no way you can mess it up. Now, I just, uh, that example is from my book, Functional Thinking, which is my most recent book. I tried as hard as I could to write a hand-tuned cache that outperformed the built-in caching for memoization and Groovy, and I didn't get anywhere close. You know why? Because they cheat. They have access to internal data structures and other things that I don't have access to, and that's probably a good thing. Because there's a lot of really sophisticated stuff going on in there that I probably shouldn't stick my hands in and start messing around with. And fortunately, they figured that out for me, so I don't have to think about that anymore, which is nice. Let me give you another example of this. So let's say you have this company process. You've given a list of names. You need to remove the single letter entries, capitalize the first letter, and then return this as a comma-separated list. And so if you're an old-school Java developer, you'll write code to do it like this. So you go in and, and you get your list of names, and then for each one of them, if its length is greater than one, and then capitalize and append, et cetera. Now, this problem would be clearer if you did three different loops instead of just one. Because you've got three tasks here. So in the perfect world, you'd create one loop that goes through and does nothing but get rid of one character entries, and then another loop that goes through and capitalizes the first letter, and then another loop that goes through and builds this concatenated string. But you don't do that. Why? Because it's screamingly inefficient. You have to loop through everything three times, and so you do them all together so that you get efficiency. Let's see what this looks like with the, the modern versions of Java, with Java 8, with lambdas and streams. So this is the company the process in Java 8. Names.stream, and I filter, and then I map, and then I collect. Let's say that you had the previous version that has your hand roll loop, and the boss comes along and says, hey, that, that code is great, but we need it faster. It needs to be concurrent. So you need to make it multi-threaded. Oh, man, okay, great. Now, in the Java 8 world, though, I just switch it to a parallel stream rather than a stream, and I'm all done. One of the great things that the closure community has done is resurrected an archaic term called complect. To complex something is to intertwine or embrace or braid together. And we do this all the time in software inadvertently. That's exactly what happened in the loop version of the Java code that I showed you. You could have done it in three distinctive loops and made it very clear what's going on, but because you had to get performance, you complected those things together, and now it's three problems mashed in on top of one another, and then you add the threading problem on top of that, and that's even orthogonal to those. Whereas in the functional programming world, you have a much cleaner separation of these things, and you uncomplect a lot of these things and just stream them together concurrently. That's the real benefit of functional programming, is it allows you to operate at a higher level of abstraction, both at the plumbing level away from things like concurrency and memoization and caching and things like that, but also from a conceptual development level as well, because it lets you craft your code that's closer to the problem description and away from all the details of how the plumbing works to make that happen. In the object-oriented programming world, uh, we try to achieve reuse by finding a collection of classes and the messages they send between one another and then pull them off to the side and package them up uh, for reuse. And so every, uh, in fact, in the design patterns book, every single one of those design patterns has a class diagram as part of the description for that design pattern. This is not the way they try to achieve reuse in the functional programming world. 
Functional reuse tends to be at a much finer grain level because the idea in the functional programming world is we're going to build a few pieces of really optimized machinery that handles really common things like maps and sets and lists and things like that. And we're going to take data plus lambda blocks that customize the machinery and pass code into the machinery and it'll come out the other side transformed in one way or another. A great example of this is in the Java world. How many XML parsing libraries are there in the Java world? There's got to be a dozen at least in heavy use and probably 50 or 100 total out there. And every single one of them follows the object-oriented principle of information hiding, which means they have their own internal data structures that are completely hidden inside those XML libraries, which means you can't reuse any of that stuff outside that context. The functional programming world, Clojure is a great example of this because they have one XML processing library. It's built in the language, and the first thing it does is mash that XML into a well-known map structure that is common in the, the Lisp ecosystem, and you already have really good mechanisms in the language for traversing and doing things on this map structure that's already there. So the common thing in the functional programming world is mash problems into things we already have machinery to solve rather than build brand new machinery for every problem we encounter. So here's one last example of this idea. I'm going to take this common Java uh, string manipulation routine from Apache Commons Index of Any and slowly morph it into Clojure, which is the, the list that runs on Java, and then look at the two codes side by side. For those of you not familiar, this is what Index of Any does. You give it a string and some characters, and it will tell you the first occurrence of one of those characters in the string. So for example, this one is 0, 1, 2, 3, the first occurrence of B or Y is the position 3. So that's what index of any does. And here's the code. This is an Apache Commons. This is a very common open source library that most Java developers have in their project. So what I'm going to do is slowly morph this into closure code. So the first thing I'm going to do is simplify the corner cases. There are a couple of chances here to handle empty strings or empty stuff. The closure data structures handle all that stuff automatically and just don't do anything if it's empty. So I can get rid of those corner cases and get rid of those guys. The next thing I want to do is closure is a, a strongly dynamically typed language so I can get rid of the type declarations and get it down just to this. And we're in neither Java nor Lisp. We're in this weird kind of intermediate language place now. The next thing I want to do is take this if statement, this innermost if statement that says if the search character of J is equal to character, then return the index for it, and re replace that with a when. When I get the search characters of this character, then return I, which is the index. Next, I want to add a for comprehension and get rid of that other for loop. Uh, this still has the word for in it, but this is actually a list comprehension in the list world. And basically what that says is for every index and character in the index string, index string is a function that says takes a string and returns an index version of it. So if I give it hello, it'll return me 1H, 2E, 3L, 3L, etc. So that's what an index string. So it's going to give me the index and character, which are pairs in that index string. And then when I find a search character, it's going to return its index that goes along with it. And finally, Lispify, so this is now proper Lisp. You pass in a predicate and a collection, and this will return you uh, the index of any. But now let's look at the moving parts. Going back to what Michael Feathers was talking about, the imperative version has 18 moving parts, whereas the functional version has four moving parts. And yet, the functional version is more general. Because in the functional version, I can do things like this. These are a, a basic constants in the closure world. So I can say, uh, index filter, give me the number of heads that show up in the string of heads and tail tosses. Uh, and you'll notice that the closure version doesn't just return me the first index that it matches. It returns all the matching indexes. But that's actually a lazy sequence. So it only does as much work as you ask for. So if I only ask for the first one, it will only give me the first one back. But it'll lazily give me all the rest of them back if I want. It turns out that even though it's simpler, the functional one is more general because the imperative one searches only strings, the functional searches any sequence, the imperative matches only characters, the functional matches any predicate, the imperative returns the first match, and the functional returns a lazy sequence of all matches. And so this goes back to that idea that in functional programming, you build these really small, very concentrated units of reuse, but they become very, very powerful. 
And a great example of this, there are two examples that have come from the closure community. One that was introduced a year ago called Reducers. This one, Transducers, that was just introduced. Uh, Reducers is basically a library that automatically parallelizes all your collection work in Clojure, but just basically for free. So now when you run Clojure applications, it'll parallelize things across all the threads for you automatically. And Transducers lets you store up algorithms and other sorts of filter operations on streams and move them around as parameters. So very interesting work going on there. So last thing about functional programming, back about, I don't know, six, seven years ago, there was a lot of discussion about language characteristics, about strong typing versus weak type, uh, typing, and static versus dynamic typing, and all these languages fall in the spectrum somewhere. I've come to believe that whether you like static typing or dynamic typing has much more to do with your personality characteristics than any kind of inherent capability in the language. You can argue about this forever, but I know people who love statically, strongly typed languages are very productive. I love strongly, dynamically typed languages, and I'm very productive. I think this is actually a red herring. I think the much more interesting characteristic we think about now is imperative versus functional, because that's the real difference between languages versus these cosmetic kind of convenience features like syntax. Back in 2006, I kind of accidentally repopularized this term polyglot programming when I made this observation that with managed runtimes like .NET and Java, we now don't have to have one language to rule them all. We can start mix and matching because they all compile to the same platform bytecode. After I did this blog post, my colleague Ola Benny came up with what he called his pyramid, which is an observation about maybe you want the, more, the, the stronger things at the bottom, the more certifiable things at the bottom, and the easier to use things toward the top. And he further clarified this pyramid by saying, well, this is actually probably what you want by volume of code. You want a stable layer, and a dynamic layer, and then a more domain layer. I think this is a really nice observation, and I've updated this now because I think in the modern world, what you really want is at the bottom, functional programming. Because functional programming actually reduces your testing burden. What are you testing when you write a unit test? You're testing that some state got mutated from one state to another, but if most things are immutable, then you don't have to test those things. If you test them one time, you know that they work. And so I think functional code at the bottom is probably where we're going. And you look at things like Link as a great example of a functional DSL that runs at the bottom of your software stack. That's a great example of the power of functional programming in a way that uh, kind of pervades your entire stack. And I think domain-specific languages run uh, up and down the stack. That's all about Lambda. So one last little bit of advice here. When you get back to work, look for places that you're drowning and don't even realize it. Now, my day job is a consultant, and there's this phenomenon that we refer to as the out-of-town consultant effect. And what that means is if you rode in an airplane rather than a car to get to a meeting, you automatically have more credibility than the car people who rode to that meeting. <laughs> there is, however, a little bit of credence to this. The Pragmatic Programmer book has a famous story about boiling frogs. Apparently, if you want to boil a frog, the idea is you can't throw him in a pot of boiling water because he'll hop right out, but if you put him in a pot of cold water and then heat it slowly, he'll boil without realizing it. Turns out that's not true. Not even frogs are that stupid. <laughs> but big companies are that stupid. And this is the real benefit of the out-of-town consultant effect because the out-of-town consultant comes in and says, you realize your frog's boiling, right? And, oh, look, our frog's boiling. We should do something about that. Looking at those things that you can't see anymore because they're just like the water around you, having someone come in and look at those things with fresh eyes very often is the thing that pulls you out of that place that you are drowning. So when you get back to work on Monday, be your own out-of-town consultant, and maybe when you get back to your office for a brief time, you can take flight. Thanks very much for attending. Hope you enjoyed the rest of the conference.
were swimming along one day, and an older fish swam up and said, good morning, boys, how's the water? And he swam away, and one of the younger fish looked at the other fish and said, what the hell is water? This little story was told by one of my favorite 20th century authors, David Foster Wallace, in a commencement address that he gave, which is online, and there's a video of it as well, which is quite entertaining. But his point of this little story was that the really important things in life, the, the point he was getting across to these students were the things that are, are so common that you stop noticing them anymore. It's just like the water around a fish that you never even see them anymore. Let's say you have this scenario. We're using some sort of sane version control, and you've decided that there's a feature that you may or may not want in the next release of your software. And so you decide, I'm going to use branches and version control to model this problem. This is an engineering practice known as feature branching, using branching and version control to handle speculative in-flight features while main development is still going on on trunk. And so Professor Plum picks one of these new in-flight features, and Reverend Green picks the other one, and they start working and doing little commits on their branches. Now, both Reverend Green and Professor Plum, being good version control citizens, know that you should periodically pull from the trunk, because active development's still going on in the trunk, and so it's the, the best practice is to pull periodically and handle the little merge conflicts that pop up. A few days go by, a few weeks go by, maybe a couple of months go by, and it's decided, you know what, we love Professor Plum, example of that. Now, one of these practices that's very common in the Agile world is this idea of continuous integration. And this was founded by the extreme programming guys because their philosophy was, let's take all these things that we know have worked well in the past and push them as far to the extreme as possible. And integration was one of those things that they observed that on projects where we were eager with integration, we had a lot fewer integration-based headaches. And so, of course, the most extreme version of that is continuous integration, which everybody commits to the main line at least once a day. But we very quickly built machinery to do this stuff for us, and now we equate the idea of continuous integration with this really awesome machinery we have to do all these tasks for us. And this is a really nice thing. But in many ways, we've lost the original intent of this idea that everyone commits to the trunk at least once a day. And let me give you an example of how projects have inadvertently strayed away from this good advice. Anymore. And I want to talk about some of those things in the technology world. So I'm borrowing or stealing his metaphor and applying it to technology. And I'm going to do so around th these three Greek symbols. And the first of these symbols I'm going to talk about is mu, which in mathematics is the uh, constant of friction. Uh, but when we think about friction in the software world, we don't think about friction from a physics standpoint. We think about friction in terms of what, happening, what happens around engineering practices. Any kind of engineering practice you have where you have introduced a silo or something like that, you've introduced friction into an engineering process. And this happens a lot of times on development teams without them even realizing it. Just like the water around fish, you start doing something and not realize the negative implications of it. And we're really big in this world about having a holistic approach of all of our engineering practices to make sure they work together well. So let me give you an example of new feature. We want it in the code base. And so Professor Plum pushes to trunk and performs what we refer to as a merge ambush on Reverend Green. Because Reverend Greeden didn't do anything wrong. He came into work on Monday morning, did SVN up, and then slam. All of a sudden, he's got a month's worth of merge conflicts to deal with, which really sucks for Reverend Green. But there's a bigger problem lurking here as well. What happened if, on the very first day of his branch, Reverend Green started making profound changes to the customer class? The very first day of his branch, Professor Plum started making profound changes to the customer class in the opposite direction. They've now been coding in isolation for a couple of months, and now Reverend Green has a terrible decision to make. Do I go back and undo all the work I did on customer and reconcile my vision of customer with Professor Plum, or, and this is what I'm terrified of, do I create a second version of the 